I believe that God wants to speak to us through His Word, not just a word for us as individuals, but as the body of Christ. And um, this morning I pray that as we speak and as we get into God's Word, that we will begin to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, because our God, who is alive, must speak into every situation. Our God, who is not just an idol, or not just a picture somewhere, must be able to have a word for us in the position that we find ourselves. This great God that we have must be able to speak. And this morning our God seeks to speak through his word. And I pray this morning as we listen to God's word that we will have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. As a Point of departure this morning, let us go to Hebrews chapter 12. We'll read from verse number 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on the earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice shook the earth, but has now promised saying yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but the heaven, verse number 27, is key. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that are things which cannot be shaken, may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Let's just look at verse number 27 when the Bible says, yet once more indicates the removal of those things being shaken. I think we can all accept that the earth in the last five years has been going through a shaking. I want us to understand that power shortages are not a South African problem. It is a global problem. Energy crises are happening all over the earth, not just South Africa. I want us to understand that politics has become corrupt throughout the world. American politics is no better than South African politics. European politics is no better than South African politics. New Zealand politics is no better than South African politics. These are not problems that are purely unique to us. God is shaking the earth globally. Now the question we need to ask ourselves is why are these things shaken? These things are being shaken so that when God begins to shake things on the earth, not everything will fall. Because those things that will not fall are built on a strong foundation. There is certain architecture, there is certain technology built in the foundation of those buildings that will not allow it to fall. China, because of its position on the earth, has built buildings that are earthquake proof. That means whilst buildings around them may be falling, there are certain structures that are placed into the foundation that prevent that building from collapsing. So when the shaking occurs in China, there are certain buildings that can be shaken, but they will not fall. They will undergo the same circumstance as the rest of the earth, but those buildings will remain. What is that building that will remain regardless of the shaking of the earth? That building is called the body of Christ. Say amen. Amen. The body of Christ will be shaken. The body of Christ will go under trial and tribulation. But like everything else on the earth, we will not fall. We will stand. Why? Because our foundation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's three points that I want us to get about this kind of shaking. Number one, it is a premeditated demolition. That means what you are seeing, you and I are seeing on the earth is not something that just happened. COVID did not just happen. It was not something that just sprung out of nowhere. We need to be able to come to the conclusion that God is in control. 
This is a deliberate act of God. Nothing can happen on the earth without God allowing it. And this shaking, these political, economic situations that we see across the earth is not some accident. It's not controlled by some Illuminati. It is the permissive will of God that has been causing this shaking. Has anybody seen a those videos of buildings being demolished. It's amazing how they set the charges in such a way that the building basically implodes and every other building around it is fine. That is called a controlled demolition. And that is what God is doing right now. He is causing certain things on the earth to become demolished. He's causing certain structures to fall because he wants those structures to fall. He wants those things to be left alone. The second thing is that this is an intentional dismantling. That means God has a purpose in mind when he allows this shaking to take place. The reason for this shaking is simply this. Whatever God builds will last for eternity. So what is God doing right now? God is removing and shaking every structure that does not bear his nature and character. Anything that does not have God at the center of it is going to fall. Believe it or not, the money will fail. In South Africa, we know politics will fail. If we are waiting for the government, that doesn't matter which government it is, to rescue us, you're going to be waiting a long time. Anything that does not bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ must fall. It will fall because it is not rooted and grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. The third point is, it is a decisive disassembling that is caused by God. What is the result of all of this? The result of all of this is that God's eternal intention will be made manifest on the earth. You see, whatever God decides will happen. You and I may make plans. You and I may decide on having our own designs in place. But God's plan will ultimately come to pass. If it means... God flooding the entire earth to remove people who are disobedient to him, he will do it. You know why? He's called God. We have become so self-important that we think that we are above trials and tribulations. Let me tell you something. The Bible has a verse in it that says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an almighty God. God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. But read Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Now, if you read the entire chapter, the context here is the glorious company that God took to Mount Sinai. When Moses goes up to the mountain and God says to him, I'm going to speak to you for 40 days and for 40 nights. And here's Moses going and the cloud is sitting on the, on the mountain and God begins to speak to Moses. That's the context if you read a few verses upwards. Now, if you go to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 32, round about to 35, God starts to give Moses very detailed, specific instructions on how to build the tabernacle. It takes about eight chapters in the Bible. The details are so specific God tells them the materials to use, the dimensions that are required. If you read that whole account, God even tells them how to make a shovel, to dig a hole. I mean, it's not that complicated to dig a hole. But God even tells them how to make the shovel to dig the hole, to put in the pole so that the tabernacle may be constructed. Now, let's just think about this for a second. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house. He had the best education available at the time. One of the things that the pharaohs did was they built pyramids. As we stand here today, engineers are still confounded about how they managed to put that together. The mathematical knowledge required to put that geometrically in shape is, is astounding. 
Today we are finding out that those things are actually aligned to certain stars and certain patterns in the earth. How they were able to do that, it's mind-boggling. If you visit those sites, the stones are massive. But without cranes and all the heavy lifting equipment, the precision of those stones being moved and literally slotted together is absolutely amazing. And I'm sure that a part of Moses' education was to see how the pyramids were built. I'm sure as the first son of Pharaoh, he was maybe a project manager, site manager. He went around, checked around what's happening. I'm sure Moses had intimate knowledge of how the pyramids were built. But God takes him and for 40 days and for 40 nights, God gives this man a lecture on how to build the tabernacle which is basically some skin, some poles, some cotton materials. There's gold here and there. But let's be honest, the structure of that, the size and the scale compared to a pyramid is minuscule. Building a pyramid and building a tabernacle, I mean, it's not even comparable in size. The detail and the maths required to do that, I mean, it's not that complicated. Why did God take 40 days and 40 nights to tell probably the most qualified man at that point in time, why did God have to tell him, Moses, this is how you'll make a spade. I mean, sure you don't, you know how to make a spade, a shovel. God had to tell him, this is how you'll measure. The, God even tells him what a cubit is, how to measure. I mean, really, did Moses not know how to measure? Why did God tell him all of these details? The answer is, because if God said to Moses, Moses, I want you to build a tabernacle. Here's a very good idea of what I want. And God gave it to him in half an hour. You know what Moses would have done? He would have built a pyramid. Why? That's what he knows. If God was not explicit on how he wanted Moses to build, Moses would have built according to his own understanding. Moses would have built out of his own imagination. He would have played with the pyramid a bit. Maybe he would have put it upside down. Maybe he would have rotated it. But the basic structure of the tabernacle would have been like a pyramid. You see, when God wants to do something, when God wants to build something, if you study the Bible from the book of Genesis to Revelation, God is always building something. When God wants to build something, the first thing that we need to do is to get rid of our own thinking. You see what happens is, when God takes us into something new, God says, I want to do something new. You know what we do? We think about the old, but better. God wants to do something new. What do we tell God? God, you know what? Yes, I want to be in the new thing that God is doing, but my expectation is don't change things too much. In fact, don't even change the thing. Just let's throw some new words in it. Let's adopt some new jargon. But we'll stay there. We basically want to stay in the same place. God wants to do some, and God is doing something new on the earth right now. Amen. The structure of church, the structure of life has changed. Whether we want to believe it or accept it, Moses has been for 40 days getting the structure from God and is now telling us how to build. You and I have a choice on to whether to migrate and move toward that structure or we can stay in Egypt. Now Moses is not me by the way, right? Moses is your pastor. 40 days and for 40 nights, intricate details on how to build the tabernacle. Because if he did not, he would have built according to his own ways. Now, just as a caveat here, what was the purpose of the tabernacle? The purpose of the tabernacle, and I need to get this this morning. I'm not very good at it, but I like singing. I love music. I enjoy music, different kinds of music. But music and singing is not worship. I'm sorry. When you went to the tabernacle of Moses, the first thing you had to do was come with a sacrifice. I'm sorry to say this to you. But if you and I come to the house of God without a sacrifice, 
time, money, energy, if we haven't sacrificed something, I'm sorry to tell you, you haven't worshipped. You can sing for 45 minutes and an hour and a half. Sorry to tell you, you still haven't worshipped. There was no singing in the tabernacle of Moses. But what did God say to Pharaoh? Let my people go so that they may worship me. What was the sacrifice? Worship. When you came to the brazen lava, what did you have to do? You had to look at yourself. Wash your hands. Wash your feet. What is that? That is worship. Coming to the word of God and saying, God cleanse me. God, look at the spots that I have on me. Look at the sin in my life. Look at the thoughts that I have. God forgive me. Here's my sacrifice. That is worship. Not this frivolous thing that we call singing. We come and we sing a few songs, lift up our hands. Most of us don't sing even. We must beg you to lift up your hands. We must encourage you to lift up your hands. We must coerce you. And it's still not even worship. You see, when God does something new, the first thing he wants to construct and deconstruct is worship. The first thing that he wants to do. I am not denying the importance of music and singing. I love it. I enjoy it. But it is not the sum total of worship. Worship is coming before God and saying, God, I want to be like you. You become what you worship. True worship, true worship is trying to imitate someone. I don't know about you, but growing up, we had football idols. It wasn't Ronaldo. One of the guys that was our, was our idol in school was Cameron. That's not being silly, that's true. Cameron was head boy. Sorry, Camps. Cameron was a top volleyball player. Mark was a goalkeeper. Those were the guys we looked up to. We had idols. And what did we want to do? We wanted to be like that. So if those idols wore a certain shoe, everybody wore the same shoe. If that fellow put jelly in his hair, everybody put jelly in his hair. That's what happened. Those are idols. If we truly worship the true and the living God, we will want to be just like him. That's worship. Anybody can sing. Although we sing badly, but we can sing. But that's not worship. True worship is becoming the thing that you worship. That was for free, by the way. Let's just move on this morning. Building the structure that will cause expansion and cause us to move. In our keynote scripture, the act of enlarging, extending, and expanding is actually the process of increasing capacity. One of the things we must do when we build new structures like God required Moses to do is we must allow God to build those structures so that God can dwell amongst us. And God is constantly, over a period of time, doing new things in the earth. If you went to church 50 years ago and John was drumming, we would have been casting the demon out of him. Okay, because he's not allowed to drum in church. 20 years ago, if I stood, like I'm standing here without a coat and a tie, I would have been literally dragged out of here. Okay, you, you weren't allowed to. But God is changing certain things. God moves in different structures and we must allow God to do that. I don't want to labor the point, but I want to show you something in the book of Luke chapter 5. And this is very, very important for us to understand. God does not change. I'm not saying God changes. But God does new things in the earth. Very simply, well, look at the structure that God built. The first structure that God built was Eden, the Garden of Eden. He then built a structure called an ark. He then built the tabernacle of Moses. He then built Herod's temple. He then built Nehemiah's temple. God was constantly building structure, each structure different from the last. But all had one purpose. That was to allow God a place to dwell. So ultimately, what does God want? A place to dwell. Today, the place that God dwells is the body of Christ. Okay? Now in Luke chapter 5, there's a very interesting story here. In Luke chapter 5, and we'll pick this up in verse 23. Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast? Now please, I am not saying we must not fast. 
Jesus is not saying that, I'm not saying that. And make prayers likewise those of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. What's happening here? The Pharisees are coming to Jesus and they're saying to him, listen, your disciples are not even fasting. Now when Jews fast, they fast for 24 hours. So it's from sundown, from sunset, till the next morning they fast for 24 hours. No drinking, no eating, no nothing. Okay? There's no cell phones, there's no TV. It's just like the normal Sabbath that they have. And they have certain fasts which they observe throughout the course of the year. Now, they are saying to Jesus, listen here, John's disciples, that means John's the Baptist disciple, they are fasting. Now you, saying that you are Jesus, your disciples don't even fast. That's the question, right? Now look at Jesus' response. Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast whilst the bridegroom is with them? You see, a religious mindset focuses on religious activity rather than the presence of Christ. Religious people focus on religious activity rather than than the manifest presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is Jesus saying to them? Hey, you worried about fasting? I am here. The Lord Jesus Christ is sitting here and you want to talk to me about fasting. Come on. Religious people are more worried about the activity than the presence of God. We can be so consumed by our religious activity that we can be oblivious to the outward working of the presence of God. That means God can be sitting here, God can be wanting to tell us something, but we say, no, no, we have to sing these five songs first. If we don't pray before the meeting, eh, it's going to be very bad. If a pastor don't say benediction, whole week is spoiled. <laughs> Religious activity. What is the purpose of the servant of God? To give you food. All the other stuff the phone calls that pastor makes, all the other things that he does, that's just by the way. That's because he loves us. I don't know why, he, but he does. But his main job, his priority, is to give us food. Now, look at the response of Jesus now. In verse number 36, he says, No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear and also the piece which was taken out of the new does not match the old. The first thing that happens, and I think I'm going to read this to you, the new thing, the new structure that God is building cannot be incorporated into the old. Let me explain what's happening here. Right? So what happens is the garment gets torn. Okay? So I've had this shirt now for five years, but it gets torn. So what I do is I go find a piece of cloth that just was manufactured today. So I take that cloth and now I patch it. Now because that patch is new, when it goes into the wash, as it begins to wear, what happens is the patch contracts. It gets smaller, it shrinks. And as it shrinks, a new tear will emerge. So the garment will tear again. You see, many times what we do is we say, God, I want to be involved in what you are doing. Right? But when the tear comes, when we see that there's something missing, what happens is you try and patch it up or deal with the trial from an old mentality. We mix the old and the new. So what happens is you tear the shirt, you patch it. In a few days' time, the shirt is torn again. In a few days' time, it's torn again. So what happens is we spend our lives running around with a needle and thread fixing the same problem over and over again. Because we have not fully migrated to what God is doing now. If you are getting upset all the time about the same problem, maybe try and find a different solution. Maybe the reason is we have not fully comprehended what God is doing now. And we are trying to stitch something that God says needs to be thrown away. The second thing that happens is that Jesus uses the example of putting new wine into old wineskins. And the understanding of that is pretty clear. New wine has not fermented. And when wine ferments, it gives off a gas. 
okay, sulfur dioxide. As it begins to give off that gas, because a new wineskin has not stretched before, like the old ones, it does not have flexibility, it does not have the capacity to contain the new, it will burst. And when it bursts, the wine and the structure is wasted. Get it? The bag bursts and the wine is spilt. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, old structures cannot accommodate the new thing that I'm doing. I'm sorry to say this, but they are old ancient structures that cannot contain what God is doing. There are certain types of people, there are certain types of organizations that can no longer hold the presence of God. I'm sorry. If the temple that was the center of existence for the Jews, they're still trying to find a new temple, by the way. That temple, Jesus said, not me. Jesus said, see this magnificent temple? It cannot contain me. And yet we think our little network and organization can contain God. We want to be where God is, full stop. If God is under a tree, that's where we will be. We don't need anything else except the presence of Jesus Christ. Old structures cannot contain what God is doing. Now, let me start my message. Okay? <laughs> yeah, you all think I'm joking. Ezekiel chapter 37, let's run through this very quickly. Building new structures that can accommodate the presence of God. Because old structures cannot. You see, when we talk about father, son, wineskins, when we talk about what God is saying at this present moment, this is not just some interesting story that we read on the internet. We live this thing. Say amen. amen. This is not just something you say, oh, I'm, I'm Pastor Justin's son, I'm his spiritual son. No, no, there's no glory in all of that. It's something we live. Something we live by. It's not just some kind of idea floating in the ether. This is the way we live our lives. In Ezekiel chapter 37, it's a famous passage of scripture. And in Ezekiel 37, it's a story of dry bones. And again, I'm talking about building a structure that will allow God to inhabit his people. In verse number one, the Bible says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. It was full of bones. The first point that I want to make to us is that we must have a spiritual perspective. You see, if we start looking at structures in terms of comfort, efficiency, and economy, we will always be wrong. Let me bring this down to where we are. If we want to find a church, let's just say, based on how comfortable it is, how convenient it is, and how economical it is, you're using the wrong criteria to find a church. That's why, in order to understand what God is doing now, we have to have a spiritual perspective. Because Ezekiel says, the Spirit brought me out. And the Spirit allows him to see the valley. And that is how we will know that God is working through us. The second point, in verse number 2, Then he caused me to pass by all around. And behold, there were very many, talking about the bones, in the valley. And indeed, they were very dry. Let's talk about bones. I think all of us know what bones is. Okay, mula, mula bones, you know. Okay, you know about that. Now, that bone had to have come from something that was once alive. Now, when you find that bone, obviously, or most likely, the thing that was alive is now dead. And if the bone is dry, that means that thing has been dead for a long time. You see, there are certain structures in the earth that were once alive. That means God was working in those structures. God was doing things in that paradigm. God was working through that. It was alive. It was robust. It was great. It was joyful. But unfortunately, God has left the structure like he left the temple. 
like the Spirit of the Lord left the temple. And now, all you're left with is a dead structure. It's not just dead, it's long dead. It's dry. There's no life in it anymore. And God says, in order to do that, you have to allow me to do certain things. The first thing that we have to do is to try and put a new structure back together. And let me look at how this structure is being fulfilled. The point number two is that structures that God has left are now dry and defunct. Point number three, verse number three. Let's read this. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, I said, O oh Lord God, you know, I am very, very weary, cautious, when God asks a question. You know why? It's God. If he knows everything, why is he asking a question? Isn't that so? So when he asks a question, I need to be very quiet and think about how I'm going to answer this thing. And Ezekiel's response is, Oh Lord, you know. You see, point number three is, we must trust in the transcendent. That's God. You see, because what was Ezekiel saying? Ezekiel is saying, God, honestly, I don't know. He's saying, I don't know. And oftentimes, when God confronts us with a question, before we even think, we have an answer. When God confronts us with new technology and new information and says to you, this is what I'm doing, I want you to do this, when the man of God is speaking, when God wants to speak through his son and through his servant on a Sunday morning or whenever, we already have a response. I agree or I don't agree. I like that, I don't like that. No, this part can't be true. This doesn't apply to me. We already have a response before God even finishes the question. Before the instruction comes out from this pulpit, we already have a response. Ezekiel is saying, God, I don't know. And that should be our daily prayer. Lord, I don't know. I don't know whether this can work or it can't work. But the one thing I know is you know. <laughs> God, you know. See, I'm okay. I'm okay being the fool. I'm okay being ignorant. I'm okay being the uneducated one. It's fine with me. You know why? God knows. Too often times we think we know. I know. My education tells me. My training tells me. My bank balance tells me. New structures requires that we trust in God. God, I don't know where you're taking us. When God said to Abraham, come, he didn't give him a map and say, follow this map. When God took the children of Israel on a, on a trip, he didn't give them how long, how far. We, when pastor says to us, do this. You know, pastor, let me just check. Let me check with my bank manager, my wife. Let me go and map this thing out. Let me have a three-year plan, a two-year plan, and a one-year plan. I'll get back to you in six months. You don't trust God. You don't trust God. When God gives us an instruction, listen. Trust God. Why? I have a strong feeling God knows more than you. I mean, he's calling himself omniscient. There's a clue in the name. Omniscient. He knows everything. But we choose to trust in Facebook and TikTok and Paul Rogan and Andrew Tate. We get our doctrine from these morons. Trust God. Don't build your marriage according to Andrew Tate. Build your marriage according to God's holy word. Don't build your marriage according to... I, I, I can't forgive my wife for this. She made me watch Pretty Woman the other day. <laughs> Up to now when I think about it, I get a little bit nauseous. <laughs> and then the second day, she found another movie with the same actors. Richard Gere and that other lady. All same. It looked the same to me. 
And I just look at and this lady on a horse. I don't know what is going on. Don't build your marriage according to Hollywood. Build your marriage according to the principles of God's word. Manage your finances according to the principles of God's word. And not somebody that spoke at a discovery something. Let's carry on quickly. Trust in the transcendent. Verse number 7. The Bible says, And as I prophesied, there was noise and rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. You see, when God is doing something new, there's always the principle of rattling and noise. You know what that is? That is noise and rattling are symbols of discontent and rebellion. When God builds, there's no noise. When God builds, there's no clamor. When God builds, he builds. And this morning I want to say to us that when God is doing something new on the earth, we feel violated. We feel that we haven't had a say. We want to have a say in how God is building. (laughs) Interesting, huh? When the servant of the Lord says, this is what we are doing, and this is the pattern that we are according to build, we got opinions. We got some suggestions. Pastor, you know, I saw this thing on TikTok. This church here is doing very well. Why don't we do the same thing? When God is doing something, be silent. There should not be rattling and complaining and noise when God is building. Allow God to build according to his pattern. Keep our opinions, our advice. If it's asked for, different story. If it's not asked for, let God build the way he wants to build. The rattling and the discontent must stop. Otherwise, the structure will not be built. We will continue working on the rattling and the noise and forget about what God is doing. I know you're not happy with me, but it's okay. Let me prove it to you. You see, what happens is we often agree with God's word, but we don't act on God's word. The children of Israel, when God made covenants with them, yes, Lord, we will do whatever you say, and our children will also be obedient to you. One month later, they were doing the opposite. Same thing happens on a Sunday. Amen, pastor. Amen. Preach it, pastor. No, you don't even leave the church. You're thinking about the ice cold beer. Next day, we forgot. When pastor says, talks about love, compassion, mercy, show grace to the stranger, you're swearing the fellow on the road. You're just out of church. Come on. Why is that? It's because the structure is not accurately built. Rattling. Discontent. Let's move on. Verse number 8. The Bible says, And as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. The skin covered over them, but there was no breath in them. The sinews here represent apostolic configuration. Apostles and prophets set structures in place. They configure, they build, they merge together. What do we need in order to build structures accurately upon the earth? We need apostles and prophets. I'm not talking about somebody who prophesies. I'm talking about a prophet. Big difference. Okay? Not me, by the way. So the first part is the sinews, which are basically connections. Okay? They connect one to the other. So the bones have come together, but there's nothing holding them together. So now you need sinews, connections. The next thing that the Bible talks about is flesh. That flesh talks about muscle. Muscle is what I've called supernatural execution. So first thing we need is apostolic connection. The second thing we need is supernatural execution. That speaks about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give us the power to do and to build according to God's plan and purpose. You see, today because we have so much of knowledge and resource and ability, we don't rely on the Holy Spirit like we used to. Before, we needed the Holy Spirit for lots of things. But today, we think we don't need the Holy Spirit. Because if there's a problem, my money can solve it, my education can solve it, I can come up with a solution, my credit card can solve it, or I'll read something, I'll solve my problem. Psychiatry, medicine, 
all of the things can solve our problems quite easily. And they're not wrong most of the time. But I guarantee you something. There will come a time in all of our lives when the pain and suffering of life cannot be solved by anything on this earth. And that's when we come to that point in our lives when we have to cry out for the Holy Spirit. You know, maybe you have a hundred thousand rand right now, cash lying in the bank doing nothing. You know what? Maybe the Holy Spirit can give you two hundred thousand. But you're so happy with the hundred thousand, you're not trusting God for more. Maybe the hundred thousand, the Holy Spirit wants to give you a million. Say amen. People don't like don't like money. I like money. You know, you got one business. Ask God for two. Come on. Why not? Why can't we do these things? Allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. Supernatural activation. Supernatural execution. Why not? Why can't we be the best? Why can't we have the best? Supernatural execution. One car can become two. One child can become two. God can double things. God can triple things. God can multiply things. One marriage, okay, no, no, one marriage is enough. Okay. The next thing that God does, he puts skin. Skin speaks of covering and covenant. No structure can be built without covering and covenant. Your home cannot be built without covering and covenant. Husbands, cover your wives. Not smother, cover. Okay? Cover your wives. Covering, protection, that's the role of a man. is to protect, to have an hedge over. Wives and husbands, covenant together. Covering and covenant, any structure will be successful. Covenant with God, it's impossible to fail. In conclusion, in verse number 10, the Bible says, So I prophesied, and as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Once God has established a structure in his way of building, by apostolic connections, by supernatural execution, once God establishes that, the people in the army, which is you and I, they move from civilians to becoming combatants. That means you move into the army of God. That means you now become militant. That means there's a desire and a drive on the inside of you to take territories for the kingdom of God. That means medicine, education, business, politics, all of those things that come under our purview also become part of the kingdom of our God. You know why? When we build a structure like this, when we build a structure according to God's pattern, that same structure will definitely work in business. It will definitely work in your marriage. It will definitely work in your home. How do we get there? Allow God to breathe into us. Allow the Holy Spirit to breathe. You see, the Spirit of God has been relegated into this spooky thing. But the Spirit of God is the Ruach. It's the breath. The Bible here uses the term in this very verse. It talks about from the four winds of the earth. That is a global wind. That is an all-encompassing wind. And God wants to breathe that on the inside of us. You know what that wind is? You know what that breath is? It's the essence of God. It's God himself. The very thing that makes God, God, he wants to breathe into us. You know when that happens? You become a son of God. You become like Adam. Everything is under your control. God will give you an Eden. God will give you his blessing. Why? He sees himself in us. I pray that as we build structures, that God is doing something new. The wineskin, according to the way this church is being built, is very different from what we have known previously. I pray this morning that we will be able to embrace, to love, and to enjoy what God is doing.
and most of all, allow his Holy Spirit and the essence of God to once again breathe over us. God bless you.